Scuba Obsessed, the weekly podcast. We talk about all things scuba diving from cool new gear, places to dive, and scuba to news. Scuba Obsessed, episode 509, is recorded live September 30th, 2021. Welcome back to Scuba Obsessed. I'm Darren Gilson coming to you from the southwest side of the great state of Michigan, where the stink bugs have decided they want to invade. Joining me this week, we have Mac the Dive Mentor. How are you doing today, Mac? Well, so far, so good. Uh, I understand I've seen you get a little bit of diving in the last uh, week or so. Actually, the club, uh, we got quite a few last week, and... Uh, this week we had a real good one on Saturday mm-hmm. back down to Merrimont. We went uh, upstream this week and uh, visibility is starting to get a little less. When the sun was out, it was great. When the sun went away, it was down to uh, maybe four feet. Uh, the leaves are starting to fall, so it's starting to cover stuff up in the shallows to the, mm-hmm. you know, to the embankments. And the currents picked up considerably. Uh, so we went up upstream as opposed to downstream, used about 2,000 pounds and then coasted back down, worked out really well. And we did find Excellent. a couple of good bottles. And they did hit the uh, South Pier in South Haven for the uh, oh. Info Tuesday dive. Excellent. So was that the original location plan was uh, in South Haven? Oh, yeah, it was South Haven for the Tuesday dive. I think it was going to be the north, but it always depends on which way the wind is blowing. Mm-hmm. You want to go on the lee side. So, but you, you, so you think the visibility down there in the river, was that because of uh, daylight, or are we starting to have a lot of leaves show up? Uh, the visibility was because okay. we had a lot of cloud cover. Um, and it got, it got dark mm-hmm. in the overhang of the trees. The current's definitely picking up, and uh, yep. the leaves are starting to fall. I figure we got another good two weeks, or at least yep. until the leaves start really so falling. It won't down. take too much time, and then it will be a mess. Well, you got a chance to get your suit back <laughs> together and get down to that special place that we yeah. used to die, but now a lot of people. And, have been so diving. everybody's found our our spot then. Well, we went down. Well, there's so much stuff out there. Uh, Deb was the furthest down. I was up maybe. 200 feet up from her. Mary Beth was another 200 mm-hmm. feet up from me. Um, trying to remember who else was out there. Uh, Edwin, he stuck around down by the car and the gang boxes. Uh, one of the newer divers, he went upstream, which was a good thing for him. Uh, we didn't have to fight the current. So, um, yeah, we had some uh, good turnout, and we had some good weather. Uh, it is getting colder, so the 7 mil and mm-hmm. the hood, uh, you're going to appreciate. Yep, yep. so we've, we've gotten into, uh, everybody really needs to be in the 7 mil, is, uh, and a hood. And a hood. Yeah, yep. Oh, yeah. Well, And matter of fact, I use my regular uh, 5 mil gloves with a liner under it, and those are mm-hmm. fine for now. Well, I'd like to thank everybody who's in the chat room tonight. I mean, last week was such a dumpster fire. Uh, but tonight we've got uh, Eric and Dave and Karen and Josh in the chat room. I think I've got everybody listed. Apologize if I missed anyone. Uh, but yeah, la- last week we were, I think we had everything all ready to go. And then my computer crashed three times in a row. It would completely outright crash come back up it would crash and then it got like a half crash where it wouldn't reboot but it would just stop everything so i don't know if i had something broken or something else is going on but it was kind of a mess Uh, so hopefully this week knock on wood we got everything going but you know for 
reasons outside my control, I had to upgrade the operating system on this laptop because I, I, I tend to not want to do that because uh, it makes things unstable. So this laptop is now on uh, Big Sur, which is the newest Mac OS. I had to do that because I had to get to the newest version of Xcode, which we use for building mobile apps. So I had to do that. Uh, and then OBS, which is a software we use for streaming uh, this podcast, had a new version. And then while I'm at it, I just tried to update everything else. You know, just throw caution to the wind. Uh, you know, juggle uh, flaming torches over a barrel full of oil. I mean, what can go wrong? So let's go ahead and jump right on into the news. First article we have up, if I share it with everybody, is... Uh, a bill out of California would change maritime liability rules after a boat fire. Federal lawmakers introduced legislation Wednesday that would change the 19th century marine liability rules in response to the 2019 boat fire off the coast of Ventura County that killed 34 people. The bill would update Liability Limitations Act of 1851, under which boat owners can limit the liability, the value of the remains of the vessel. In the case of the Conception, the scuba diving boat where an inferno trapped 33 passengers and one crew member in the bunk room below deck, the boat was a total loss. The legislation would be retroactively applied to families of conception victims. If it passes, official said, the tragedy was one of the deadliest maritime disasters in recent U.S. history. Now, how do you like that? Uh, you know, as, as much as I feel bad for the families, uh, I am not a fan of retroactive laws. Do, do you think there's a, an appropriate point? Well, the key item here is they don't have any money, so they can't get any remunerations or compensation anyway, period, ever. I mean, for that many people, uh, the big we got to the fine print is don't clean the Coast Guard. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because they failed to find that or find the deficiencies. Now, that opened up an interesting can of worms there. So you go to the deep pocket, which is government yeah 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 well i mean it, from an attorney standpoint i mean if i was the family's attorney certainly uh you can't get money out of uh a comp of, of something that doesn't have any money yeah so let's see let's go back the uh the 1851 law is a time-tested legal maneuver that has been successfully employed by owners of the titanic countless other crafts and uh, as some as small as jet skis has been origins in the 18th century England, where it was meant to promote the shipping business. Carbo Hall, who represents the area where the Conception disaster occurred, said the 2019 fire prompted lawmakers to see how they could help the family of victims. While nothing makes up for the loss, the very least they get just and fair compensation that's owed to them, the aftermath of this tragedy brought this to light. Feinstein in a statement said the law doesn't account for modern tourism such as excuse me, commercial dive boats, Passenger Vessel Association, a trade group, did not respond to a request for comment. Under the current act, the company Truth Aquatics and owners Glenn and Dana Fritzler have to show they were not in fault to the conception disaster. Even if the captain or crew are officially blamed, the Fritzlers and their insurance company could avoid paying a dime under the law. The Fritzlers' suit to the limit of the, their li uh, liability remains ongoing in federal court, Attorneys for the couple could not immediately respond to the request for comments on Monday. Jeffrey Goodman, attorney for the family, told the Associated Press that long overdue legislation may not really affect the conception case because the Fritzlers do not have many assets to compensate the family. However, Goodman said the bill is an important broader sense to hold boat owners and operators accountable. Removing the financial protections provided them will promote maritime safety moving forward. National Transportation Safety Board investigation disaster did not find the cause of fire, but it blamed the vessel's owner for lack of oversight and said failure to post night watch allowed the flames to spread quickly. The Conception's captain, Jerry Bolin, pled not guilty in February to a rare federal manslaughter charge. Prosecutors say Boylan fared, failed to follow safety rules before the fire broke out in September 2019 by failing to train his crew, conduct fire drills, and have a revolving night watchman on the boat. When the fire ignited, his case is pending. Oyland and four other crew members who had been sleeping above deck escaped the fiery boat after the captain made a panic, panicked mayday call. So is this been a case of this has just been broken all this time? Uh, what, what kind of a, uh, effect will this have on boating in general? 
Will it make it safer, as they say, or is it just going to? Well, if you don't. Go ahead. Well, if you don't have any insurance, you know, and you don't have a lot of assets, like there's the conceivable So then, I mean, what's the incentive yeah. not to? Not to have the law? Well, why have insurance? If you don't have a lot of assets, you know, you may have to have insurance to cover your boat. But if you have limited assets, do you care if you get sold or sued? Now, is the reason they have limited assets because this was set up as an LLC, a limited liability corporation? That part I don't know. That's a sort of inter- that's yeah. an interesting part. Because a poor people don't have boats like this. I mean, you, you and I cannot, uh, without really going into debt, will not afford a boat that does 33 passengers. So Correct. But then again, the expenses incurred to maintain that may eat up any profits that you get. So you're just ba- barely able mm-hmm. to maintain, and your asset is your boat. Yeah, yeah. So th- th- that, yeah, that's that's some of it is just trying to figure out where is it in this process that uh, is unable to, f- to deal with the negligence, if that's the case. You know, allegedly negligent, yeah. but you know, from the information we've seen, that certainly appears to be the the way it's heading. Now, this article here doesn't have that other aspect. I was looking for it, where it talked about suing the Coast Guard mm-hmm. for negligence and failure to perform the uh, boat tours and boat safety inspections. They should. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how they would have caught this from the aspect of no roving night patrol. How do you, you know? How do you capture it, let, Let's that? say this wasn't on a boat, that this is a car. Say somebody that or, or bus, maybe that that's a better thing. You got a bus, the driver falls asleep, you know, which I think we can say uh, is something you shouldn't do, and then runs the bus off the road. You know, is it the responsibility of the police to know that that was going to happen? Because in this case of the boat, it was them not having a night watch. So how would how would well, Coast Guard? That's, that's, that's the other item that, that you know that's speculative. By the way, you realize that. They said the lack of the fire watch made the fire faster, yeah. the way they read it. That's not necessarily true. Whether he had been awake and spotted the smoke or something, it may have made a difference, but depending on where it started, could anybody have gotten out through the flames? Well, that and then part by. They still don't know. At what? So, say the fire started down below. By the time it's visible to somebody who's awake on a night watch, uh, it may have already been too late, but yeah. So the wording yeah. was a little sketchy. But this article over here does not even talk about the continuation of the lawsuit to the Coast Guard. Yeah, they they didn't mention anything on that. But I did read what you're talking about, where they had they were talking about suing the Coast Guard. So we'll have to see. And then here we go on this next one. Our I almost say favorite, our our frequent uh, Golden Ray shipwreck. Not that it frequently is shipwrecking, but it's still there. Uh, hangs on as workers reinforce the cradle. And they're in the picture. They're showing the uh, the crane list, uh, lifts one of the two remaining sections. Uh, after the final cut was completed a little over a week ago, humongous chunks of the shipwreck known as Section 5 could remain in St. Simmons Sounds for another week, hanging in the arch of the VB-10,000 crane vessel as Salver shore up send-off barge. Anxious as local folks are to see the next to the last section of the shipwreck Golden Ray out of here, salvage engineers are focused on ensuring that the dry dock barge can safely and effectively haul it away. This according, according to the U.S. Coast Guard. That means building a more elaborate cradle on the dry dock barge's deck, one that accommodates damage done to Section 5 shrunken, sunken port side hull. Crews are working through the second week of construction, a more robust cradle that will account for the missing piece in the port side, I'm said. TNT salvage engineers produced a 3D model of the new cradle, resulting in double checked and modified the company's engineering team in Germany. So they go on and talk about a bunch of this, but we've got to be getting right down to the end. You'd, you'd, you'd think. Yeah. So how back on the cost of this, this has got to be uh, about the price of two of these boats new. 
It's a no-win situation. I think it's interesting how they talk about the uh, the Swiss army knife of this salvage operation. They're talking about some of the equipment they're using. It's got so many um, multifaceted uses and abilities. And they're still, after doing all this work, still, still have to modify the equipment they're using to mm-hmm. continue with the job. Like you said, the money yeah. keeps rolling out. Yeah, and anybody who's done any sort of projects, uh, and even a small to moderate scale, knows how expensive that can be, and this is a whole nother level. I mean, there's, there's nothing standard about anything that they're yeah. doing here. It will be interesting to see the total cost. Well, I know how much you love these photos, Mac. Creepier cool deep sea photographer shares photos of freakish seabed creatures. Scary looking marine creatures captivate deep sea diver photographer Mark Andrew. Let's see, how can I slaughter his name? Be Adolia, who lives in the Philippines. He said he dives four times a day to capture the perfect image. Uh, said he's always passionate about photography, especially underwater photography, but it took time to acquire the right tools. There's a interesting guy. You, it's it's hard to tell that's even underwater. He's he, he must be shooting at night, mm-hmm. of course, because they're not getting any background scatter. But uh, some of that's pretty freaky looking. Yeah, I'm not sure how comfortable I would be <laughs> in the dark shooting pictures at at these when there could be Mama somewhere else. Yeah. It's bigger Mama's than these there, guys. or you're you're like lighting yourself up as a silhouette for a, a quick snack, snack oh, for yes. somebody. Yes. Tell us a little shrimp. There you go. Yes. Yeah. Great His Twitter pictures, handle huh? at Underwater Mojo. <laughs> uh, there's another one. Yeah, it's beautiful. Little nuda branch. I'd like to know the depth that he's working with, and does he deliberately work at night like this? Because that's what it seems like. Either works at night, or he's doing some photo editing that just uh, bumps up the contrast. That's the thing with a oh, yeah, uh, a lot background. of photography now. Uh, which I think this is fine. I think it's okay to go in the. Uh, Photoshop and clean and edit and contrast because you're you're really trying to make an artis- artistic statement, but there are purists who get a little bent when somebody uh, goes and just does these these images. Uh, because if you were there, even in person, they don't sometimes look this this amazing. I I went to a couple of the mm, photo clubs mm-hmm. where they have contests, and then you see the initial photo, and then you see the photo they entered, and there's no comparison. To me, photography was what can you do with the camera, not what can you do with the programs to mm-hmm. redo your your picture. Because what they took and what you saw, final product, right? But I, no I think this is fine, but I think it should there should be the option for a class. I mean, they they should have a class of hey, here it is untouched, and here it is edited. Uh, because if you if you showed the average person the two of them, they would go for this. They would say, yeah, this is the one I like. This is the one, and oh, this absolutely. is what they want to put in a magazine or put up on the wall. Is one of these. Yeah, just just look at that. That's uh Well, they've always said that photography, even when you're doing the chemicals, is you can work oh, yeah. the chemicals and the timing to edit the, the photo anyway, yeah. which I understand and they did, but not to the extent of megapixels being able to manipulate background. As somebody who worked itself. in a dark room for years. Uh, we used to do a lot, dodging and, you know, lighting stuff up and different techniques. Uh, in I worked in the commercial print industry in the darkroom. Uh, but we were more than happy to go digital. You go to, go to the electronics and, and let uh, you know, some of that help us out. Uh, let's see, what's, here's another one. 
Yeah, you don't have the chemical, you don't have the smell, you don't have the dark room. You just need a high resolution yeah. monitor. <laughs> yep. A good program. Yeah. Well, how many people we used to have uh three hundred people who just worked dark room and film and uh now we've got exactly zero. So that tells you how things have changed. Oh, that's an advertisement which you don't need. So I think this is a uh, little bit of uh, who lives in a rock under the bay. Uh, I think that this is when you're supposed to yell SpongeBob or something. I said a brand new type of sea sponge discovered near Deer Island. New species of sea sponge has been discovered in the Bay of Fundy. Uh, a Latin name I will not pronounce is bright orange creature, which glows in the ocean bedrock. In thin crust up to 30 centimeters across. The first specimen was collected by a dive team from Huntsman Marine Science Center in 2016 near Deer Island with the assistance of Connie Bishop of Kojo Diving, said Claire Goodwin, the biodiversity research scientist who identified it as something previously unknown to science. Uh, Goodwin has written a scientific paper describing the new species, now published in the Canadian Journal of Zoology. Uh, biodiversity. Uh, her, her, her co-authors, Curtis Din, Javier Malero, Claudia no Nozeres from DFO. Oh my goodness, the names get uh, more fun. Uh, Ekat Erna, the Fodova. Just, I have to apologize. If any of these people ever come across this, you know, m my apologies. Uh, I have a problem saying Mike and Karen, so... Uh, Russian Academy of Scientists in Juk Nahoff, who used to work with Goodwin on the, at the Huntsman. It's quite satisfying the name of new species, said Goodwin. Even though she's done it 74 times, they're surveying work all over the world. Sponges have distinct geographical community, she said, because they are only in larvae for four days. They can't travel very far for the length of time. And once they mature, they don't move at all. Uh, very few people have studied sponges, said Goodwin, especially the east coast of Canada. Estimated 15,000 species so far, only 8,500 have names. Uh, that makes unique names important. It's only by making sure that we have, using the right names, that can accurately document our biodiversity. Um, <laughs> a committee, a naming committee, helped come up with this one. In their indigenous language, said Goodwin, uh, the name means something reddish-orange and animated which gets water squeezed out of it. The new species were collected during a provincial-funded survey to look at the potential sponges to monitor environmental impacts such as aquaculture in hard bottom areas. Now there's a little bit of uh, scuba gear porn going on there in that image. Look at that. Uh, they got quite a light and quite a housing. That is a looks like a, a open circuit tank, so it must not be. Yeah, it does. I don't yeah. see any bubbles, but yeah, it's it's hard to. Yeah, I'm just I'm just going by what she's got in her back and the uh, the regulator hanging there off to the left side. Uh, we know that some species of sponge can be sensitive to environmental impacts, such as siltation. Sponges are filter feeders, says Goodwin. They eat very tiny particles in the water the size of bacteria. The particles are sucked in a system of chambers, she said, where little cells with tails beat, drawing in water and filtering the particles out. Sponges make those tiny particles in the water column available for other things in the food chain, too, a good, uh, said Goodwin, providing an important link between the water and other life in the sea bottom. There are loads of really interesting things to see. We've got some amazing habitat. Now, is that a reason why in the fresh water we tend not to have as clear of water? Uh, because, you know, the salt water, if you've got sponges, which are filtering uh, items down to that level, uh, I don't think we've got an equivalent in the fresh water, do we? Not that I know of, now that you bring uh, that up. I mean, up. about as close as we've got is, you know, the zebras and the quaggas, and that's been fairly recently. So other than that, you know, it would be just natural conditions, uh, you know, algae and plant life. Uh, wasn't you know, some there's some fry, some smaller fish that would be doing that. 
And, and they go on. You, you can read the article. We have, we'll have links in the show notes. Um, they got some nice documentation here. So good. Good to see people are spending some time researching this. And then, as this article says, the shipwreck is back. It says history repeats. What can only be described as a repeat performance. Yet another maritime disaster has befallen Bali's sister island of Nusa Limbongan. But it's not all bad news. On September 15th, the massive industrial barge carrying supplies to build a new tourist harbor was being towed by a tugboat around the northwest corner of the island's barrier reef and a tourist section of reef that bears the full brunt of uh, Bandung's Straits sneaker sets and confused currents. In an average old, in an age old scenario, apparently the tug shaved the edge of the reef too close right when the uninvitable biggest set of the day pounded through. Uh, the tug made it over, but the barge was doomed. The tow line parted with a wang, and the barge was swept around on the island's most infamous section of the reef. Astonishingly, astonishingly this barge settled in the exact same location as another giant cargo ship that previously ran aground in the late 60s under the exact same circumstances. That previously stricken ship that gave the reef's infamous surf break its namesake, the shipwrecks, or shippies if you're Australian. Not that it's currently too terrible disaster for the local surfers who enjoy the wedge that bounces off the barge in the exact same manner as it did in the 70s and 80s before the original ship was devoured by the sea. It's like our own wave pool right now, uh, said Board, Board Riders Club competition director Como Wilson. Us young guys have only heard from the old guys what the waves were like when the first ship ran aground the reef. We're always envious because the waves are supposedly so much better, but now we believe them because even the old guys are saying the wedge is back. <laughs> Some of the pictures are very yeah. awesome. Especially the one you've got yeah. shown right now. That's pretty yeah. nice. The, Hang ten. Yeah, so right right there it's all it's all breaking. Uh what are the odds of a ship? Well, I guess if that's where your traffic, I mean, you know, what's the odds of a semi breaking down on the highway? I mean, given enough time, if that's the direction of travel, that's going to happen. Uh, so w what was it? Let's go back to that upper image. So, so here it is showing it. I was going to say, if you, if you scan down a uh -huh. little bit, you're going to have a really interesting shot uh, right there. So you take a look how high that weight yeah. is. That's awesome. But I wouldn't want to be on the wrong side of that wave as it smashes back into that Yeah, you barge. do not want to be on the uh, the upside, I, I would say. Looks like fun, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I, I, I just had, because normally we just hear about how bad all this stuff is. And then here you have the, a group of people who are like, ah, this is awesome. We get to go diving. Got some, some great <laughs> waves. Uh, they said, efforts continue to minimize damage to the reef and float the barge to safety. But in the meantime, the Balinese ceremony is in the works to bless the rescue efforts in the sacred reef. The waves that attracted the surfers are such a vital part of the island's tourism industry. Obviously, we don't want to last forever. And our boat riders club is involved in the work. We are advised as surfers. We know the reef better than anyone. That reef supplies a lot of food to the island, so we need it back for sure. So the wave situation, just a little dream goes away, and we're okay with that. The priority is saving the reef and keeping our waters clean. But yeah, they're, they're, they're having a little bit of fun there with that. So here we go for one. No, we got two more to go. Uh, says goodbye, Caroline Eddy. Civil War shipwreck were buried, reburied near St. Augustine. It would take millions of dollars to preserve the timbers if they were removed from this context. Uh, Meade previously told First Coast News. Last week, an archaeological team in St. Augustine painstakingly unearthed a historic shipwreck. However, you'd never know it if you walked by and you had been swathed by a sand once again. Archaeologists believe the wreck was of the Carolyn Eddy, a, a ship 
built in Maine for the Union Army during the Civil War. It was later used as a merchant ship. It was a team from the Lighthouse Archaeological Marine Program that finished uncovering the ship. In November, nor'easters, winds, and waves pushed the sand off part of the ship's hull. It had been buried for decades. In the past weekends, it was reburied. It would take millions of dollars to preserve the timbers if they were removed from this context. Archaeologi archaeologist Chuck, I'm saying Mead, I don't know if that's how you would pronounce it, previously told First Coast News after archaeologists finished documenting the wreck, they covered it with sand, which actually helped the shipwreck because it would be more preserved under 9 to 10 feet of sand. Samples and photos are taken in Carolyn Eddy's before it was buried. The ships that met its fate, the sand would now be protected by it. So they mentioned millions of dollars. I don't care if you had a billion dollars. What are you preserving? No. <laughs> it's like, what? what? I mean, yeah, you could float. The, so, and actually, I don't even, yeah, maybe a million dollars. You'd have to have a tank. You put the wood in it. You'd have to make sure it was moist, and then you'd slowly replace it with glycerin or some other agent. But what you've got there is all you're going to get. You know, sometimes we've seen amazing things with metal wrecks where they can uh, do some electrolysis type projects. But that's it. I mean, it's just a it's just a section, and not even that big a section. What would you say? Maybe fifteen by twenty five. You know. Well, looking at the size of those people. Yeah. Yeah. 15, yeah. 12, a little bigger than that, but so. Yeah. So here the, you rough. see one view. Now, how do you think, how do you, how do you think this compares with the Green Bay? Uh, I think the Green, the Green Bay is. Now, the, the Green yeah, Bay. It, it looks like a shipwreck. Ship, right? It's more what we see in the Great Lakes of, of of wrecks that have splayed open. Uh, and that actually moved this year. So that's more intact. This is just, yeah. this has a little bit more depth in it. I mean, there's more layers to it, but that's it. So this is actually a chunk off something else. So I don't know if. Well, you, you wonder what's under that flat uh -huh. section. You got the loose ones on the top and you got look like a decking. I always wonder what's under there. Yep. But, uh, you know, they had enough time to get the publicity to go out, get the shot. Uh, it wasn't on their list for this year. They document where it is. They probably knew where it was. You know, here, here's a photo of it all covered in. Is this, a, is this that same beach we had before? It seems like I remember this, this walkway in the condos. Remember earlier we were... Yeah, it possibly could be. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. You know, we've we've covered so many of these I can't remember, but it seems like we've seen one, or or maybe that's just what the East Coast beaches look like, <laughs> nothing but constant condos. <laughs> okay, and then here's the one to wrap it up for this week. Divers bring Solent shipwrecks to life using artificial intelligence. Project UN Path set in motion by the University of Portsmouth. Divers are set to bring underwater shipwrecks back to life using virtual reality and artificial intelligence. University of Sports Smith has received a share of a 14.5 million pound funding to contribute to UN Path. Is that UnPath or UN Path? We'll say UnPath. Newly launched marine heritage project. The project aims to identify to uh, devise new ways to visualize underwater landscapes and identifying shipwrecks. Barney Sloan. Historic England's principal investigator for UNPATH said, As an island nation, our maritime heritage is of fundamental importance to who we are, especially if I get the money. Oh, wait, I added that in there. Uh, I will transform it in a way with researchers and the public can access a huge variety of collections held in museums, university heritage institutions, commercial organizations, and indeed the public. The project will bring together expertise in digital humanities, computer science, marine heritage, will unleash the massive research project of our shared maritime paths. How will they revive the shipwrecks? One part of the project will see divers digitally scanning underwater shipwrecks in the Solent on a help cut edging technology. They include the Holland 5, one of Royal Navy's first submarines, which was the seabed off Eastbourne. Dr. Ann Coates, the project lead for Portsmouth, said there's such a rich history below the sea. Shipwrecks provide exciting, unique, Evidence of societies which built and supplied and crewed the vessels, and unlike sites and land, shipwrecks are often left alone, little discovered, so they are preserved in a single moment in time. 
Mary Rosa celebrated example, but some wrecks at the needles are not yet identified with a myriad of new stories to tell. So there's the Mary Rose. Mm -hmm. Uh, besides exploring shipwrecks, the project will also try making maritime archives records accessible the first time across all four UK nations and open them to the world. Dr. Coates added, UN Pass seeks to resolve how to break down the barriers to access these wonderful archives. Gaining the AHRC award is a tremendous opportunity to raise awareness for the significance of Portsmouth's maritime history and culture. More projects to happen around UK. UN Path project will only one of five major discovery projects being funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council through five-year program towards a national collection. Professor Christopher Smith, Executive Chair in Arts Humanity Research Council, this moment marks the site of the most ambitious phase of research and development we have ever taken as a country in a space where culture and heritage meets AI technology towards a national collection is leading us to a long-term vision of new national research infrastructure will be a benefit of collectors, researchers, and audiences right across the UK. I don't know. I still, I, I listened to all that and I still don't have any idea what they're doing. Uh, it had all the proper technology buzzwords that I'm accustomed to. Uh, but it didn't say, is this really indicating what they think they're going to do? So this is announcing they received 14 and a half million pounds, which was at probably 20 million or so us dollars, uh, which can go quick yeah, depending on what you're doing. Uh, project aims to devise new ways of virtual underwater landscapes identifying shipwrecks. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure what they're doing. I was hoping to find out, but it doesn't say. So hopefully it's good and that the UK taxpayers are pleased with the results. I'm always curious about the return on the investment. Yeah. Well, we, we know people who are involved with, I don't know if this particular project, but people who are over there. So maybe we should reach out and see what they have to say. So you've got one item left, right? Snorkels. Do I have snorkels. Did I miss something? Maybe I didn't click on. I think so. I not click on snorkels. Snorkels sold at Costco. Did I, Recall. did I miss that one? Oh, there it is. That was the first one. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm. I'm trying to contribute to my own dumpster fire here. Let me just throw a, <laughs> throw some snorkels in there. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing: is does it really? When I see an article like this, where they say where it was sold, what are they trying to do with that? Is is Costco responsible for the snorkels? I mean, because. It, work in retail and part of my career a lot of times you're you're buying a product you know you're you're not out there going and saying you know so th th this is this just to me yells of clickbait costco being in there like hey if you really hate costco you've got to read this <laughs> or maybe they're going the other angle uh if you go to costco all the time you probably are going to die because you bought a bad snorkel um so snorkels that were exclusively sold at Costco, meaning that they paid an extra dollar <laughs> because is there such things exclusive in the snorkel world? I mean, it's like anything else, you know, your TV that you can only get there. They changed the model number and maybe the plastic edge around it. Um, so they're exclusively sold at Costco or being recalled because an issue that can cause them to leak. The recall involves about 76,000 units of the Oceanic Adult Dry Top Snorkels. The notice post on the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission website noted, the problem is the bottom purge valve can actually leak, thereby posing a drowning hazard to the user. In some instances, a snorkel's lower purge valve may let water in during use. The issue described only concerns a snorkel in the set. The quality of snorkel mass and fins, however, delivers performance you can expect from Oceanic. Oceanic received 13 reports of the snorkel leaking. So, so here, 76,000 units sold. 13 people reported that the snorkel leaked. One injury, minor cuts 
to the consumer who tripped after the. St- well, how do you? Okay, <laughs> how do you trip? <laughs> I'm not making. F- because you're in the shallows. Or in the, shower. In the shallows. So you had one one injury involved. The miner cuts the consumer <laughs> tripped after a snorkel leak has been rep- You tripped. I have never tripped while in the water snorkeling. So, so yeah, I'm, I, I think you're right. I think they must have been in the shallows. You know, they spit a little water in because it leaked. I'm not saying that leaking snorkel is a good thing. Uh, and then they probably stood up panicking and then tripped. So that would be one. Well, the other part, they're talking about the little, you're, you're familiar with what they're talking about. Yeah. Do they show it? it? Yeah. So when you can pull, and, uh, and I did not see one, but my point, I suppose, is how do you know they didn't get sand yeah. in the there and things? So, oh, I'm sorry. I'm not showing the, the article here. Let me go do this. So here's, here's a video they have with it and see that in the bottom right there. There's a little purge valve. So, you know, the, the normal snorkel, you know, right there at the end, uh, they're, they're trying to, the, you know, they, everybody to improve it. Uh, so I guess if you're snorkeling, yeah, that's a big deal to snorkel. Us as divers, the snorkel's the thing that you stuff in your pocket because you get tired of it hanging around your mask. Uh, but Especially but some of the these river. have the valves, or the idea behind the valve is that as you, like, say you're diving down with a snorkel and you come up, it's a way for that last little bit of water to purge out the bottom. Uh, so that valve yeah. was leaking. So as you go down, the water slowly starts moving up that snorkel. And then when you breathe in, you've, you've got a slug of water, which again is not what you want with a snorkel. Uh, so, um, so it says the imported by Jewish Outdoors in Salt Lake City, which is a major importer of of underwater products the snorkels affected by the recall are white and gray in color and about 16.5 inches tall sold exclusively at costco as part of the snorkeling set from february to july of this year so 2021 a pandemic buy it affects the batches being numbered 2038 39 40 41 42 43 so all the way up to 20 like sequentially all the way up to 2115 so my guess by this is that there was something with the mold that as it went on, you know, because normally it, this is just, this is not just a QC problem. This is something war out of tolerance to be able to hit that range. So U S consumer product safety commission, if you think you may have them, go visit that site or you can do a you know nice quick Google search. We'll have, Links in the show notes. Oh, here they go. Here they're showing a little bit better view of that. Do you see that, Mac? Yeah. So oh, yeah. that's what they're talking about. That right there. And that's usually, I don't know if it's even spring loaded. I think it's just kind of a, kind of like a check valve more than anything else. As a check yeah, valve. So. so the solution is you take a balloon, you put it around that, and you'll use it like a regular snorkel without a purge. Yeah, we're we're not advocating <laughs> like we're, we're not advocating any modifications. Like like you yeah, didn't know. Like days. everybody did, but we can't say that you can do that. <laughs> yeah, but it goes to with all things, you know, complexity. You added complexity in because you can see this, because this is not the cheapest snorkel you could get. This is one where you thought you were buying an upgrade because this is a feature that they put on there. You know, because you're you're only going to use it once. Yeah. You're at Costco. You're going, hey, I'm either going to use this in the pool or I got a trip, and I want to be able to use it real quick. Uh, Oceanic clarified the recalls being done in cooperation with Costco, so customers should not return the recalled items to store. I hate this. What the hell you mean? I don't return it to the store if it's a recall. They want you to do something else because it saves them money. They said, yeah. those who affect the product advise to stop using it. Instead, register to get a replacement snorkel at no cost, including the shipping fee. They should also destroy the snorkel by cutting it. And that's something to be aware of. When you buy stuff at the uh, at a yard sale, it could be this. They got the, the original owner got it replaced. And they're like, well, you, next guy, you beware. I got this for free. Uh, actually, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so for the last 50 years, okay, and that's them trying to save their brand. Oceanic's a major brand. Uh, so, I mean, these things happen. Uh, it's, it's in batches. So those are manufacturing batches. 
then it you know goes you know how bad was it is it because they had and and where were the the where do you report leaks that it gets to the consumer product safety commission well it didn't sound like they had a lot of no. complaints either 76,000 so you're you're talking 76 well and and the thing is this is like uh rebates of the 76,000 I'd be surprised if they got 4,000 people return them because what most likely happened you went and you bought it you used it in the next two months in the pool it's going to sit in the closet for 20 years until you get tired of it and you throw it out or sell it to yard sale so I think the 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 risk of this is more to people buying secondhand goods than it is to uh, the original buyer. I've I've got a bunch of snorkels. I got a bunch of snorkels. My wife, anything that looks like it could be dive gear, my wife buys, and I just smile and say, "Oh, thank you." <laughs> but I've got, you know, fins that I could. No, there's no way I could ever use. Uh, you know, mass from twenty eight years ago. Uh, all sorts of stuff. So. Maybe they're antiques. Maybe I could sell them as an antique. We drove about two weeks ago over at uh, the boardwalk. Jake left, I think, four sets of good fins just to see how often or how soon they disappear. <laughs> you left four sets? They were gone the next day. Yeah, he had, well, Jake has a lot of stuff to get rid of. <laughs> and uh, as opposed to sell it, he just left them there with the kids play to see who took them i'm just curious if one person took them all mm -hmm. it could be so these are were these extras of his or were they stuff he found uh, not okay. found maybe bought okay. images and stuff yeah. yeah they're fun to play around with okay well that does it for scuba in the news well you know as well as i do a diver nowadays i was gonna say a diver nowadays doesn't want the old-fashioned looking fins, oh, no. and they want the uh, spring bands. They don't oh, yeah. want the yeah. rubber straps yeah, let, anymore. Let's, uh, let me see if I can do a quick search on uh, scuba fins black. Let me see. Yep. So here, here here's the uh, so here here here's the in style fins. I would say in the not quite that community, wouldn't you say? Everybody's got kind of the black. Oh yeah, I take black, those. black fin. You got the spring. Um, probably run you about 120 bucks. You know, here's another one. You know, Aqualun. Oh, that's that collectible though. That's an older one right there. eBay Aqualung U.S. Diver spoiler fins. Those are kind of coming back in style. So all all sorts of fins. Where's the split fin? Yeah, split fins. A lot of people do like the split fins. Have you ever used the split fins, Mac? I never nope. did either. They're supposed to be easier to use. So there's a while they were selling them. Here, here, let me pull one up. So there's an example of a... Well, I think the length of it is different. Uh, flexibility, depending on if you're looking for power, if you're looking for a long stroke. Mm -hmm. I think the fin is really dependent on the type of diving you're doing. Yeah. And it's what you like. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, there's no law that you have to have a fin. I mean, you're, it's a, it's an amplifier. It helps you when you're kicking, move. And I have in a few select situations not have fins, and you wish you did have fins because you, it helps, especially when you're trying to get on the up the on the dive boat in those waves. Oh yeah. Now here's here's another fin that I've seen. Um, this is a scuba pro where it's got kind of like that mechanical pivot point there in the middle. I've always thought mm -hmm. that one kind of looked interesting. I don't know if they're any good, but they're kind of like a fashion thing. You know, it's like, yeah, how many different ways are there to make a fin? Maybe, maybe that's a, a video we need to do. Well, I think the spear fishermen use a different type of fin than the normal right. scuba diver. And generally we're doing it in a different type of environment of, River, pond, very seldom. I mean, well, Great Lakes, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now I've seen those. We got a pair of those fins there at Wolf's on the. Now is shelf. that is that an older style? They're it's yellow. called a force fin. That's another one off of eBay. Yeah, here's here's some of those. Yeah, it it kind of reminds me if you ever look in any of the old patent books on horse bits. 
it's like everybody there's like 10 million patents on horse bits seems like there's the same thing with fins everybody's tried to come up with one that's just a little bit better you know, there's there's like a split fin but not quite a split and there's another one a little bit split now here's one almost looks like something from the aliens movie it's mares all sorts of fins you see i've seen a lot of these these fins I'm a little biased because sometimes wolves will have uh, surplus and they'll be in there for, for several years so that's kind of what I see it's like kind of you buy a fin and until you're not happy with it I've only bought a couple sets yeah, I think uh, this is probably similar to uh, except that's got the strap on the back yeah, everybody wants to watch me shop for fins which I don't need I don't need new fins right now can you ever have too many fins? Yeah, Karen in the chat room says she likes her split fins. Let's yes. stretch. And then you can't have too many. Uh, yeah, Karen saying Jake buys a lot of stuff online auctions. He's always been on the Red Rooster Facebook Live buying stuff. Uh, and then she talked about a little bit early working in the dark room of photography class in college. So many ways to do cool stuff with photos. It, it's an art. You know, you can play with it. Uh, if you enjoy it and you're happy with the results, you know, more power to you. Um, of all the things I did in the printing industry, Darkroom wasn't the worst. I, I mean, everything's about productivity and time and value of what you're doing in the industry. So, uh, so. Well, you know, like they said, the fins are made for different purposes. You have snorkeling fins used for shallow mm -hmm. depth. Uh, they're more basic. Yep. They're shorter in length. Uh, and they're done that way so snorkelers can make a small flexible movements for easy maneuverability just below the yeah. surface. Uh, it's also a lower risk of coral damage mm -hmm. when you're swimming near and through them. So, I mean, that's some of the different items that you yep. look for. Uh, then you have travel fins. Travel fins can be, what, 15 to 20 inches, more like a snorkel or a traditional snorkel fin. Mm -hmm. But then they get up to what 24 to 26 then you got the open heel then you got the booty yep. it's uh, depend on what you're doing how you're doing it what's your comfort level yep. well the and your pocketbook and, and some of the probably the the people i would say are the most uh selective in their fins are the free divers when you, you see the free divers really going those depths those fins are quite a bit longer than what we would use in most scuba diving yep. So this last week we talked about it a little bit at the beginning of the show, but was there any absolute uh, great dives in the last two weeks? You know, we've had quite a bit in the river, uh, some in Lake Michigan. Uh, I think we still have buoys on the um, shipwrecks out there in the preserve, but it's probably time to get those in. We had some, well, how big were those waves that they had a few weeks back? Nine, nine feet, feet nine feet nine feet last week uh i think the buoys north of us have been taken in i do believe the havana buoy is gone okay. now uh i think jim is getting some guys to go out to take the uh st joe yacht club buoys they want to pull those i don't think they got that done this last weekend and i they may be trying this weekend oh so, uh yeah it's winding down yeah and as, as you were talking, I was, I was trying to see if I could snag some of your uh, photos you had on Facebook. Because uh, I, cause you you just been out this last week. Uh, I was just a fly around day, yeah. Yeah, out there, some, some of the shoreline. Nice beach there, though. I mean, it's still pretty darn close when you look at the, the mm -hmm. beach part to where those houses yep. are. That's not a lot yeah, of room. You just got a little bit there on the edge. Uh, is how, that beach was probably two to three times bigger before we had the it high water. Be. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple of them who uh, put in applications to put dikes around their place, mm -hmm. and they were, of course, turned down. Yep. So, like this one we're looking at here, this is Tuscorny and Silver Beach. So, the St. Joe River, where it uh, goes into Lake Michigan, uh, the river is the darker water there. Uh, lighter is south of the pier, and uh, just a sh little bit shade in the green there is north of Tuscornia. 
beach. And this Gornia is where we where they called you a few years back to look at that uh, wooden structure that came ashore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the politics with with shorefront is kind of interesting there. Uh, like all the property, M much of it used to be uh, Coast Guard and. One hundred and fifty years ago, I was saying one hundred and fifty years ago, that whole lakefront was different. Everything behind it that's got all the houses, mm -hmm. that was actually a swamp back there. The biggest uh, health issue back in those days was malaria. Let's see how close we can get in on this. So what we're doing there is we're seeing there's the river. Uh, yeah, this might be a good opportunity for us to sh uh, share with people. So the turning basin, when you say the turning basin, is that up there? That's up here by the, by the bridge, right? Yeah, by the bridge, you can see the white area where the uh, concrete get where they get the concrete yep. stuff from yep. you can see that cut in place that's what we call whirlpool basin mm -hmm. that's going to be redone into a park by the way and that will then be called uh water tower park i believe the water tower of course is now gone so, so this white tower here is the concrete plant. So that's staying. Yep. So you're saying this, so they got the, the, the marina here. That's where we used to do a lot of diving, which is now got that hotel. Or is that, or is that, no. Right. That is correct. Yep. And then here's up here. You know, we got three rivers or two rivers coming together. Uh, and you can see some of these are canals that were added. They probably weren't there originally, or this is much lower property. There's the island we're seeing just at the edge of the photo. Uh, see what else do we have here? Here's another view. Uh, that's showing the in the middle there. Um, it's showing Benton Harbor. Um, both the drawbridges, you can only really see the one. The one closest is going off the edge of the photo. One a little bit farther away. Too zoomed in. Is that what I'm doing? Oh, yeah. There we go. Lions Park there in the water. Lions Park. <laughs> now, what they have. 30 years ago, you had beach. Now you've got the uh, field along the shoreline mm -hmm. to keep that from eroding any further. That goes down 20 Now, is feet. that new steel or is that steel that was hidden under the sand? That's new. They put all that, those pilings down to protect what was left of the beach. Let me zoom in so people can see what we're talking about. You can see the outcroppings too, the breakers. Mm -hmm. It's probably four or five feet deep in those areas around that. And that was to knock down the wave action and to try to save the beach. Last winter, you had uh, probably a six foot hole or ditch on the sand side, mm -hmm. running the entire length of that. And they've, they filled it with sand then. Yep. Yes. And those houses down there are going to be in dire straits down the road. Yep. So is this at Eagle Point Marina? Is that what we're seeing here? Yep, that's Eagle Point. Yep, there. Uh, Still a lot of boats out there. That was kind of swampy land for a long time, and then, well, probably in the late 80s or 90s, and they built out this marina. Uh, yep. It's probably the most upstream marina of any size there on the St. Joe River. That is the, the biggest. Yeah. yeah, back in the day, uh, Dean Masson used to have the tugger, which was uh, an old fishing tug, was there. We'd have to get on it there, go all the way back out to get to the Havana. The ride was forever because the little tug didn't make a lot of speed, but you could put mm -hmm. 15 people on it. Uh, the chat room is asking if that if if you took those photos from an aircraft. Yeah. Not, not, a drone. not drone photos. 
Yeah. No drones. Uh, no. Let's see. And then this is a Lakeshore School. It's a kind of incredibly local. Not quite much for scuba diving, but it's kind of interesting. St. Joe just continues to build and build. St. Joe is a, is a, is a school system is broke. <laughs> Yet they've got a ton of donors who have no problem in giving them money for sports fields. <laughs> so the same thing for Lakeshore. I mean, that you take a look twenty years ago, that oh, wasn't there. No, this is field, and this is I was not there. Yeah, this is uh, just in the uh, last few years that they've been doing this out, and they've got like the, in there in Lakeshore, they got that interior building. I don't know what they've got going in that. Yes, is that soccer? Uh, they've got. Uh, um, Yes, that, that off to the left, and here's and here you have the soccer uh -huh. fields, multiple soccer fields. Yeah, yeah, all the soccer fields there. Yeah, because this, this is my this is my route. To, if you if you want to stalk me and intercept me there on Cleveland Road, that's about a daily path for me. Uh, yeah, the soccer fields. I've got a ton. This this photo really doesn't show it, but then the. You know, let me zoom in a little bit. Those fields, there's there's well, enough if, for if them. They, if, they go to my, if they go to my site, you can see them really clear. Yeah, yeah but you can, there's a lot of, that's like one, on a Saturday in the fall, they probably got 20 games going on there. And there's the... Uh, you've got parking in that one part, and then where that white section is, that's another section of parking. Yeah, and they're showing a football field there but that's not the yes. but that's that's like rocket football that's not the high school yes. football yeah. no that's correct yeah the high school football got bleachers and everything yeah yeah so that's like the fanciest rocket football field you'll see yeah lake shore is not shy bering springs trying to keep up with them we just bering has got a very nice facility yeah. and that new field is awesome yeah they finished the new field and then parks and rec is uh is uh adding a whole new section so all the uh i'm trying to remember what they call it the great lakes parks and rec association is all moving off the school property onto the Ornoco township and then they're uh making room to build a new high school so they've done the performing arts they just finished the football field we had the grand opening about a month ago would have been a year ago if not for the pandemic it, it had been finished. It still hasn't been inspected. The state doesn't have elevator inspectors. <laughs> I guess they had one or two in the whole state, and they don't currently have one at all. So if you're in Michigan, beware of the elevators. Uh, <laughs> your, your Halloween tip. Uh, and then the Performing Arts Center, They've that's supposed to be open in an uh, athletic field. The gym is gigantic that they're putting in. Uh, which we're going to take it over for robotics. We're going to do a robotics competition there. Uh, and then they will be a, uh, they had vandalism on that too. Earlier this week, some kid uh, spray painted it. Uh, estimated damage, $100,000. Whoa. For orange spray paint on the building. And I'm like, you know, if this wasn't a new construction insured, somebody would come up there with a little bit of paint thinner and take that off. I mean, because it's yeah, and maybe I I won't we'll take the podcast on that one. But well, that's a nice view there, Mac. Underwing, is that what we're seeing? Sunset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're looking for a yeah. sunset. Yeah, beautiful. Another the one there, looking out the river. That was a little awkward. You can see the sky. Mm -hmm. You can see where the lake is. And then that whole white part is clouds. Hmm. And it's approaching the airport. And the clouds are less than 400 feet above the ground. Uh, isn't that like almost fog? <laughs> or a fog wannabe? Uh, yeah. I guess, right. Uh, the the uh, camera at night takes real good photos, makes it look like daytime. But you can see the cloud base already coming in. Mm -hmm. That's 400 feet. Yeah. I'd prefer to get down on the ground before that covered up the airport. Yeah, yeah. the 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 sensors in these cameras. We're, we're not. We're within a few years of those sensors being ridiculously amazing. I mean, they're already really good now. I get it. It can be dark, 
and I put that on the windscreen, and I can see the runway really nice. Okay, I think we're, we've we've looped back to the beginning, but uh, yeah, some some great photos. I I I love. Well, I think the the items we found were on the. If you went backwards, you'd find the dive stuff. Was there dive stuff? Oh, let me look. Uh, we'll oh, we'll yeah, take a look at dive treasures. Uh oh, here we go. That's really what what we want to see. So here's the dive ones, dive photos. Uh, so so this is from the twenty six. Boy, we, you would think some of these. Actually, the twenty fifth. That was Saturday. Yeah. High so noon dive. These. Uh, so that's electrical insulator. You have the required golf balls. Official dive. Uh, yeah. Is that the white? Is a cold cream? Is that what these are? Cold cream and a couple of thumb oh, yeah. jars. Mm -hmm. People are using a lot of cold cream. Seems like every time you dive there, you can pull up as many as you want. Oh, another milk? Was that a, was that a clean? When you were, when you were a kid, what did you buy your mom? Palms, cream, or Jergens hand lotion? Yeah, that's true. Uh, so was that a good milk chug milk bottle there? Actually, there was two very nice milk bottles. Yeah. Any embossing or? Uh, yes, embossed. On part of it, and then the silk screen that was was uh, missing from it. A couple of cokes that were worth taking. Yep, there you go. Wow, somebody was hitting some balls in the river there. I, I there were so many of them there. I kept the only ones I kept were the yellow ones, just for the hell of it. That's a flashlight, another cell phone, a cream bottle, or is that an inkwell? Or did Nope, that's bottle uh, cream the bottles. Yeah, the cup is actually better than one on the left of the cream bottle. There's a nice cup that's got um, pictorials on the side. One they've been chipped at the mm -hmm. keeper. Nice. And then these are canning jar lids, aren't they? The little white things. Is that what those are? Yep. And the reason you keep those is sometimes you find designs on the top and the, mm -hmm. the jar lids themselves. That are worth keeping by themselves. Yeah, I, I, in the next few weeks, I need to really clean up my collectible collection because I'm looking at them now, and if I can't remember where I got them from and they don't mean anything to me, it's time to go. But I hate throwing some of them away. I kind of like this Art Deco glass, but it's just so common, and it was made for so long. Uh, but if you like it, you keep it. Yeah, I mean, I... I it, the clear is hard to sell the wife on. You know, if it was uh, like purple or pink or something, then. Well, yeah, you can get the amber or the green. That's pretty nice. Yep. Uh, oh, then we had a you had a flashback there, from uh, four years ago, and and I look at this and it's like, no, that was last year, not four years ago. Well, not last year. It was a couple. It was. Well, I remember four that's years when we ago. filled that dumpster and we had the trailer and like that big. Yeah, big tank, but you know, pandemics kind of screwed up all sense of time. I have no idea what year it is or yeah. anything. Yeah, the only thing I kept out of that whole mess was that strobe, which I still have and works. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember if that was there was one year I cleaned up and a lot of the uh, I found a, a a a little jeweled brooch and I think I ended up winning a lift bag out of it. Oh, so here, here oh here here's another one. Gosh. This is going to be the uh, podcast of Mac and Darren watching f Facebook. <laughs> uh, w what is that white in the background? Is that that's uh, at a planner? That is no, actually, that was one on the lamp. You know uh -huh. the street lights. That was one of the old glass globes on it. Oh, so that was like uh, translucent, so light would f show through it. Yeah, oh. yeah. It wasn't even chipped. See, that, they had a fire down there, because this is down there by behind the uh, Wonderland, right? Yeah. Yeah, they, this, they push so much stuff in there. And it's amazing, like you said, if that didn't break. Uh, you know, and what's that, like a little crock or jug there? Ooh, and they got some nice emboss there in the little cream bottle. Yep, I mean, totally, totally intact. No cork, but no X's on it. And a nice milk. Yep. I mean, it just gives you a wide assortment in one day of the weird stuff you can find. Yep, tons of great finds there in the in the river. 
and it's fun. You know, it's shallow dive, uh, a little warm. Oh, and here's a sign. I got to show this one. Uh, this this yeah. water is unsafe <laughs> to drink. <laughs> so the question was, well, do we dive it anyway? Yeah. Now that's a sign. I think that's the type of sign you, there's a marketable value for a sign like that. I mean, go into any uh, of the your uh, chain pub stores, uh, Cracker Barrel or Applebee's or something. They always have a sign like that in there. Skull and crossbones. I mean, how many times do you get a public sign with skull and crossbones? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, especially where you're diving. Yeah, maybe, maybe that needs to be the uh, artwork for this episode. Dumpster fire. Uh, let's see, is there anything else worth taking a peek at? What was that at Wolf's Marina? It was like a steam fire truck that you had? Yes, that was a pumper. Pumper. So... What's the story behind that? Is it just somebody parked it there? Or? It was there, and I thought, damn, I got to get a picture of that. It, yeah, all they do is take the line, you toss it in the river or whatever, or your source of water. That would pump it, put it under pressure, so then you can spew it out someplace else. So, it, But I, I just could why was it out there? Is it just somebody? It, it was on a, on a trailer being hauled someplace. Uh, it was a lot of brass. It's nice to look at. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, got some nice angles of it. Gauges. American Fire Engine. Seneca Falls, New York. Very nice. You take a lot of eclectic pictures, yes. Well, I mean, they're, it's, it's fascinating. Live vicariously through you, because all I'm doing now <laughs> it, it's, is robotics. It's a rebuilding year, the damn pandemic. Uh, we didn't have anybody who knew how to do anything. So we were starting up from the ground. So normally in the off season, I'd be doing two nights a week. We're doing four. And it's like four hours, four nights a week. Wow. It's just wearing me out. But we got to get them back up. If you're going to be competitive, you know, if, if nothing else, I, I'm a little too competitive. <laughs> it's uh, we'll, we'll get them going. Then. Yeah, stop looking at your photos. Oh, is this a joke? The three contractors? Uh, yeah, that's a good one, though. Is it? So we'll kind of we'll kind of tease that before oh, yeah. we go on. Three contractors are bidding to fix a broken fence at the White House. One is from Chicago, one is from Kentucky, and the third is from New Orleans. All three go to the White House to official to examine the fence. New Orleans contractor takes out a tape measure, does some measuring, then works out figures in a pencil. Well, he says, I figure the job will run $9,000. That's four thousand for materials, four thousand for my crew, and a thousand dollar profit for me. The Kentucky contractor does the same measuring and figure it out. Says I can do it for seven thousand. That's three thousand for materials, three thousand for my crew, and a thousand profit for me. The Chicago contract doesn't measure a figure. He leans over the fence, over the White House official, and whispers twenty seven thousand. The officer incredulously says, "You didn't even measure like the other guys. How come you come up with such a high figure?" Chicago contractor whispers back, 10000 for you, 10000 for me. We hired the guy from Kentucky to fix the fence. Done, replies the government official. And that is how government stimulus plan works. <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. A lot of there truth. is a ton, a lot of, truth there's a ton of truth in it. Because it's more important to have a guaranteed excuse and an out than to be the most economical. They didn't get they didn't get any votes for being economical, but they get plenty for who they help in business. <laughs> yeah, so kind of our mini soapbox moment there. Okay, I got I got see as as anti Facebook as I am, I they suck me in. I get I get pulled in. Can't stay away. Um. Uh, so let's see. Do do we want to talk about any more about the diving? Is there anything remarkable? I mean, we've got. Oh, all, what I would like to do a call out is anybody who's got any uh, diving for Halloween. Uh, we may be able to get another episode edited not before Halloween. So if you've got underwater pumpkin carving video from previous years you'd like to share, we'll do them as uh, intros for whatever episode we get that runs close to Halloween. Uh, 
I'm surprised SAS doesn't have a fucking carving contest. Or maybe they a do. A lot of them do. I, I yeah, the, the things I tend, you know, the first few years of the podcast, I, I covered them and I don't now, is the underwater pumpkin carving and the Santa Clauses and the being getting married underwater. Those three things... You know, your local newspaper loved to cover them because it's unique. But in a podcast where we talk about diving, they're happening every week or every season, every year. So maybe we just need to do a, a, a again, we talk about doing those weekend episodes. Maybe we just do one where we, we kind of OD on it. And then anytime anybody asks, you go, just watch that. That's got it all in there. So do you have a dive safety story for this week? Well, actually I do. Uh, all swept away. Separation from a photographer buddy gets a scuba diver into real trouble. Andy slowed her breathing while she hovered above the reef line. She attempted to make herself invisible in the water so the tiny fish would reappear. She really wanted a close-up of it coming out of its hole. Finally, Andy was rewarded with the perfect shot. She took three frames before the, the fish disappeared back inside. Startled by the flash from Andy's underwater strobes, it moved away. She moved away from the roof, looked around for her dive buddy, Cliff. Now the divers. Cliff and Angie had been scuba diving together for years. They had a routine. Angie was an avid underwater photographer, but Cliff liked to hang out in the water and enjoy the scenery. He had a sixth sense for finding small critters in the reef, so he often searched for Angie's next subject while she worked her camera. Cliff was never moved, or he never moved far from Angie, and neither one of them liked to be, you know, a bad dive buddy. They made a good team, supporting each other in the water, and they were both in their 40s and both in very good health. On the morning of the dive, though, Cliff wasn't feeling 100%, but he wasn't about to let that get in the way of making the dives. They hadn't had a chance to dive in a while, and while he didn't want to disappoint Angie, he skipped breakfast, hoping his stomach would settle down. The dive. Conditions were nearly perfect for the planned dive from a small charter boat. The charter specialized in small groups, no more than six divers at a time. And that's exactly the way Angie and Cliff liked it. It minimized the chance of another scuba diver would disturb her photos and or damage her camera. The divers promised the rule of 80s, 80 degree air, 80 degree water, 80 foot of visibility. And I sure liked that <laughs> myself. There was a strong current on the body bottom moving diagonally across the dive site, but Cliff and Andy agreed they would hide between the coral formations, stay near the boat. Andy was after small critter photos, setting her camera up for macro photography. So there was really no need to swim far from the reef. Now the accident. After watching Angie set up her shot and move into position to photograph the, the fish, Cliff decided to pull the reef and look for Andy's next subject. He knew she was hoping to get a photo of a clownfish for her portfolio. Fitting from one coral formation to the next, Cliff moved out from behind the protection of the reef, exposing himself to the strong current. He, strang he swam against the current so he wouldn't be carried away from the dive site, working hard to move to the next outcropping. Cliff was nearly to the next formation when he got a cramp in his left leg. When he turned to stretch it out, the current caught him and pulled him away from the reef and out towards the sand. Realizing what was happening, he struggled to stretch the cap and swim at the same time. Neither worked very well, and he floated further and further away from Angie and the original dive site. Angie finished taking her photos and looked up and around to find Cliff, just in time to see him struggling as he floated away. She clipped off her camera to a BC and swam towards Cliff. Cliff was a simply, uh, attempting to self-rescue and swim with his hands. And you realize what he needed, grabbed his fin while supporting his ankle, stretching out his leg. She sniggled for him to relax and just float. In a few minutes, the cramp relaxed and Cliff could swim again. Then they both looked around and they realized they'd floated too far away from the dive site to make it back. They agreed to surface swimming in the direction of the boat as they did. On the surface, Cliff deployed his surface marker buoy, signaled to the boat crew they were okay, and the crew kept an eye on the dive buddies while they recovered the remaining divers, then moved to pick up Angie and Cliff. Now the analysis. 
Now, often underwater photographers get so absorbed in what they're doing, their dive buddies feel they're diving alone. In Cliff and Angie's case, they had an understanding about their respective roles on the dive. Despite that, Cliff really didn't have a buddy on the dive. No one was keeping an eye on him or ready to help him out in an emergency. A small issue, such as a leg cramp, can quickly escalate to a larger problem. Many times we have discovered and discussed uh, how a small trigger item can lead to panic and a serious accident. When a diver is uncomfortable or unprepared for a dive, all it takes is a small incident for the percentage or for the perception, the narrowing of the mindset that comes with panic and sets off a chain reaction. In Cliff's case, he wasn't feeling well, was mildly dehydrated on the morning of the dive. He hadn't been scuba diving in a while, so he wasn't used to wearing fins again. Those factors led to a leg cramp. He began the process of self-rescue, was under control, but floating away from Angie. Cliff was smart and swam into the current when he moved away from Angie, initially ensuring that he would be able to make it back to her. But he hadn't planned on the cramp. While trying to remove the, disc remove the discomfort, he drifted away from the formation directly into the flow. The dive incident is relatively minor and not uncommon. Slight complications such as an accidental mask, flood, or crap happen every day in, in the water. It is always the diver's response to the problem that determines whether it is a quickly gotten minor inconvenience or the start of a potential disaster. In Cliff's case, and he had not been had not seen him floating away and responded to give him aid. And he had not had he not remained calm, he could have easily panicked, bolted to the surface. In a panic situation, it's easy to forget your training and neglect to exhale on ascent. Wouldn't be the first time something as simple as a cramp led to a series of events that would end with an air embolism. So the lessons for life have a plan to support your buddy. Even if you have a task on a dive, don't forget about the buddy. Alternately, your buddy should seek training in solo diving and be prepared to be completely self-sufficient. Often practice self-rescue skills. Too often divers learn skills in their open water, but never practice them again. During your next safety stop, remove and replace your mask. Practice relieving the cramp. It'll serve you well down the road and practice buddy rescue skills. See the above. The next time, practice air sharing drills. Don't dive if you aren't prepared. No diver wants to disappoint a dive buddy by backing out of a dive, but don't dive if you aren't mentally and physically prepared for it. Better to miss a dive than not to come back from one. And last, of course, don't forget to breathe. Always maintain an open airway on your ascent. Everything we know, but how often do we practice? Probably not enough, but I know we have in the last year practiced some of those skills. I know I'm I'm always afraid of the Charlie horse. I have a common affliction with Charlie horses above and below the water. Uh, I do all the potassium, vitamins, be properly hydrated. Um but it can still happen. You used to do quinine before they decided that that would cause you harm. Because there's nothing worse than a Charlie horse that you cannot move quick enough I've never, to get rid of. What's that? You've never had a Charlie horse? I mean, I've never had one. I don't want to have one. Yeah. <laughs> for for uh, my understanding of Charlie horse is it's a lot of like lactic lactic acid buildup from exertion uh, and I will get them in diving it doesn't happen all that often but because I get them elsewhere like that's one reason why I've never really took up uh, kayaking because I can't imagine trying to get out of a kayak when you have a kayak because uh, the charley horse you got to stand on it uh, you know, if, if you get a trolley horse and you can't, st because standing on it fixes it, or in the water uh, with dive gear on, you kind of grab the, the tip of the fin and pull it towards you, and that will help. And I've had that, I, I don't have it commonly, but it's one of those things, it's, it's, it's 
when it happens, it hurts. So I'll be, you know, half a dozen times, if not more. But that's in a thousand dives. <laughs> But it's nice to know that if you have an affinity for something like that, to be prepared for it and to practice something, mm -hmm. something as simple as clearing your ears is a big one for a lot of people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and we, I talked about in the podcast in the early days, the first, I, you know, cause, cause clearing your ears underwater is different than in the air. And I never had problems on a plane. I never had problems driving in the mountains you know, you'd get it and you'd clear it. And then you know, halfway through my open water dives in the pool, going to, it's like I, I, what I didn't do is I didn't clear early enough because you, you got to kind of learn when you need to clear how you clear. Because I think it's different for everybody what that, you know, technique is that helps you equalize. Uh, and you don't keep going if you can't equalize. You got to stop. And I think that's a mistake I had is, <laughs> yeah, not yeah I think smart. I, you know, at like 15 feet, I thought I was equalizing and I wasn't. And then when you get down to 20 feet, you know, it's, it really, to me, happens more in the shallows. When I get deep, I'd rarely ever have any problem. It's in the, you know, between 10 feet, you know, 8, 10 feet and 20. But what's weird, and maybe the, like if I do a breath hold, I never have a problem with equalizing. It just, but when you're on a regulator, there's something about that where I do in that. 10 to 20 foot range and then get deeper than that. I don't have a problem equalizing, but good things to practice. Good tips. Thank you for that. I'd like to thank everybody who's listening to the program. Uh, I've got to, I, I got to, I got to notice that the, my, uh, I, I do online security for some of the automatic subscriptions. So I have to approve it. So hopefully the pot, the website's still alive. <laughs> it didn't go through because I hadn't approved it. So I need to take some time here probably on this week and get everything all lined up. But it's that time of year where I got to pay for all those hosting renewals and we buy a year at a time. And then also our, uh, uh, so we got the website hostings, which not only includes our website, but all the nonprofits that we support, including the uh, Mud Club and the uh, Underwater Preserve and the underwater recovery divers i use that all in the same plan so i got to renew those and then uh the hosting for the actually for the podcast uh both the websites and the streaming which has been a lot of changes we're moving on to podcast 2.0 so keep your eyes out for that i've got to do some work on blockchain you know anything with blockchain mac you, you're familiar with bitcoin or anything along those lines no nope, not a bit as a technology person, I look at it and I went, oh yeah, that's technology. Why does it have anything to do with anything else? But that seems to be a way of handling transactions and kind of avoiding some banking fees. So I think it's time I dig into that and do that. So in the next few months, we'll be putting that in. I've, I've had pretty good luck with Patreon. So, uh, you know, Scuba Obsessed uh, let's say I think it's Patreon. Scuba uh, Patreon.com Ford slash scuba obsessed. Is that it? You would think I would know by now. Uh, so you, you can do that or you go to our website, go to www.scubaobsessed.com, provided I paid the, the hosting bill, and then uh, click on an episode in the, in the right column. There's a link on how you can, you can donate and support us. Uh, and there's some, some gear I'd like to get. There's actually some uh, new recording equipment that would kind of make the process go a little bit smoother apologize for the gaps in getting episodes up it's the editing is taking quite a bit with video it's it, it's it's crazy i i had gotten really good at audio only i could do audio probably for every hour of audio i could it only took me 30 minutes to edit for every hour of video it takes me probably five to ten hours to edit so a little bit more time. I think I can get that down. I think I can get it for two to one. Uh, one hour of uh, edited video for two hours of time. But just got to work through that process. Uh, but we certainly appreciate your support. You know, our Patreon supporters that are out there is what keeps us going. We would not have been here nearly this long without you. Uh, so thank you. And let us know what you'd like us to do. The show at scubaobsessed.com. 
go to Facebook, go to our website, reach out to us anyway. If you don't hear me from me one way, try another. Uh, I'm crazy busy with work, but for some reason we've been able to do this for 12, 13 years now. Uh, keep keep it going. Let us know what you what you like. I, th I think video is really the way to go. So while well, our podcast listeners are our base and important, we'll always have podcasts. Uh, we'll be doing more with video. Let's see the chat room. We've ignored them for a little bit here. Uh, I guess the Wrecking Crew has a meet and greet this weekend, but by the time you hear it, it's probably already going to be over with. Um, uh, wishes for uh, Karen. Hopefully that, uh, you know, her, that she's feeling better. Doesn't sound like she's going to make it there. Uh, and then she gave us a, a, she said she used to drink tonic water and quinine and take magnesium supplements for, for bad muscle spasms. Yeah, the quinine was my go-to. Uh, my grandfather took it and I took it because we both had Charlie horse, but yeah, I, uh, some, some sort of, you know, minor thing like liver or kidney damage, you know, yeah, we, th those are optional organs, aren't they? Uh, <laughs> depending on what your, your beverage of choice is. Uh, so thank you uh, for that. Let me see. What am I missing out? And, uh, Discord, so I got all these different chat rooms to watch. Um, yeah, they accused me of talking to my, my imaginary friend earlier. Not saying I don't, but it could happen. Um, do you have anything you want to plug, Mac, before we get on out of here? Oh, just make sure you get your uh, Halloween candy situated. It'll be here before you know it. Yep. And what I'm showing up in the camera right now is that green bar in the bottom is our upload link. The blue is the download link, uh, Starlink, which I do own Tesla stock, which is not SpaceX stock, but uh, has been doing better. They're coming out of beta. They're not quite out yet, but the quality of the service has really stepped up. So I think they've done something in tweaking the software where they were holding some things back on us. So I'm looking forward to these laser-equipped satellites. Uh, but... It's been a real game changer for me out in the boonies. We would not be doing video if it wasn't for some of this. A little expensive. It's about 100 bucks a month plus an initial investment. And I've got a bunch of networking gear I need to change out. But uh, we'll do it for over time. Um, so again, if you, can, if you are enjoying the, the podcast and you can swing a little bit our way, we'd certainly appreciate it. Uh, are you ready for that time of the show, Mac? Absolutely. Been sitting down. I'm okay. Ready. Okay. I was looking at maybe a, sometimes I'd like to pick a bad, uh, a bad, bad, bad joke. Is that possible? <laughs> so that we can do something else, but I don't think I got any backup. So we're going to, in tradition of a dumpster fire episode, we're going to be jumping without a net. Or as I said in the show notes, uh, an extra 40 pounds of dive weight and my BCs deflated. A la uh, young Peter. Once had an old ladder. The ladder was one he found in a dumpster just a few years before, and since he was poor and needed a ladder, he snatched it up and considered himself lucky. Over time, he used his ladder in large murals. He would invitably be off kilter. It would not sit flush to the wall. A rung would slip and rotate under his foot. He began to get very frustrated with this janky old ladder he was using. One day, while painting a sign above the entrance to his shop, the ladder mistreated him again. Having had a long day already, it was the last straw. He lost his temper. He jumped on the ladder, grabbed the miserable thing, and shook it like a baby, screaming vulgarities at it. With his rage, he broke two of the rungs off and started to beat the broken ladder with him. A group of young people passed by and saw his outburst and asked him what he was doing. The painter rep responded that he was beating the ladder to death before it killed him. The youth thought this looked like fun and asked him if they could join in. The young painter found the situation suddenly hilarious and said, of course. The group came over, beat the ladder, threw paint on it, made a commotion. Suddenly, a woman came out of the nearby shop shouting and screaming at the group. Uh, was not going to get away with their vandalism, she called the police on them. As she was shouting, the police car pulled up and a neatly groomed officer walked out and walked over towards the center of the fuss. The woman shouted at the officer, gesturing forcefully at the group of young people. These vagrants are vandalizing and destroying property. Arrest them. They're trying to shout at the riot. Arrest these criminals. The officer looked at the mess of the broken ladder and sputtered paint and asked what was going on. 
Young painter somewhat sheepishly explained the situation. The officer who didn't know for sure at the time, but was actually a pretty good judge of character, felt like he was telling the truth. He laughed and told him they should probably clean it up now, and the group agreed. The officer turned to lead, but was stopped by the bewildered shriek from an enraged woman. Aren't you going to arrest him? They're going to riot and loot the whole block. The officer turned around, looked at the woman, and said, uh, Ma'am, excuse me, but I must say, two rungs don't make a riot. Okay, now that was sort of cute. <laughs> <laughs> Am, am I ruining my reputation if that one if that one wasn't wasn't it not bad enough? <laughs> I didn't want that to go to your head. I'll I'll try. You know, as, as uh, egocentric as I am, you know, I I'll 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 just have to restrain myself. So on that note, until next time, go out there and get wet and stay safe. <laughs>